You know, the last three weeks we've saw Babylon destroyed. And uh, I'm telling you, when God does something, he does it right. Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm ready for something else. Uh, and when we start chapter 19, uh, it's an exciting chapter. Uh, folks, Jesus wins the victory. We win. And I know right now it seems like the devil's, you know, winning, but I'm telling you, he really isn't. All right? Jesus came that we can have life and have life abundantly. We don't have to be depressed. We don't have to fear. We don't have to worry. The Bible says we shouldn't have fear. We shouldn't worry. So I thank God for his word and the encouragement of his word. Today I'd like to talk to you about heavenly hallelujahs. Heavenly hallelujahs. If you have a bulletin and want to follow along with us, uh, three points. Number one, praise God for his salvation. Salvation, the greatest gift ever given to mankind was salvation. Number two, glorify God for his bride, for his bride. And we know that the church is Jesus's bride. We are the bride of Christ. And number three, worship God for the witness of Jesus. If I ever had someone that I wanted to witness for me in the court of law, I'd take Jesus, all right? He never lies. He speaks the truth in love. And so we are excited about uh, the scripture that we will cover this morning. You know, the Bible gives us many reasons for giving thanks to God. We should praise him for who he is, what he has done, where we will be for all of eternity, and how much he loves us. We are truly a blessed church and a blessed people. Revelation 19 shifts from earth to heaven. As seen all the way through Revelation, there's much praise in heaven. This praise reaches a high point in our text today. And by the way, you want some more praising? You want some more clapping? You want to get fired up? Come back tonight, all right? Six o'clock, old-fashioned hymns of praise. Two choirs, First Baptist Alma and our choir, and we'll have two quartets also, and we are going to have a great time of praise. Jesus Christ will remove sinners from the earth after the battle of Armageddon and set up his earthly kingdom for all his saints. Heaven will rejoice because our full salvation has come, because justice is served to all of mankind, because Satan's rebellion has ended, and because God is in full control, and because the marriage of the Lamb is about to be completed. Let's look at this encouraging scripture from God's holy word. Praise God, we see four hallelujahs in much worship in Revelation 19. Now to understand, I want to give you just a, a foundation so you'll understand when we get there what's going on. In Revelation 19 and 20, Jesus is seen in three ways. He is the bridegroom in Revelation 19, 6 through 10. It's scripture we'll be covering today. The second thing he is, he is the conquering king. In Revelation 19, 11 through 21, we will cover next week. And third, he is the righteous judge in Revelation 20, uh, 11 through 15, and we'll cover that after Easter. And John uses a Jewish wedding as an illustration for what is to come in our text. It is a great description of Jesus, the, br the bridegroom and the church, which is the bride of Christ. And there's three parts to a Jewish wedding. First is the engagement. The engagement usually lasts one year and is uh, arranged by parents. Second is the presentation. There's a week of festivities, and, and, and the, the groom goes and gets, uh, gets the bride. The third thing is the ceremony, which ha is the marriage vows and the marriage supper after that. And here in our text, we can see the parallel to what uh, uh, John has written here, the engagement is the election, okay? The election, even before the foundation of the world, God chose us. The presentation is the rapture of the church, and right after the rapture of the church is the judgment seat of Christ. 
And then the ceremony uh, is after that. And then, the, in, and again, in my opinion, the second coming comes next, next the thousand-year millennial reign, and then the battle of Armageddon, which we will cover, and then we will go to our eternal state in heaven. So I praise God for what is happening in the future and that we will be a huge part of that. So let's look at our scripture. Praise God for his salvation. And after these things, and again, it goes back to chapter 18, Babylon finally is destroyed. I heard a loud voice and a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. And when you see the great multitude, I believe these are angels. And the reason I think they are angels, because later on, you will see that there will be uh, the 24 elders there, and they will be praising God. So I believe this first hallelujah comes from the angels. And hallelujah literally means praise the Lord. Folks, I believe with all my heart, we do not praise the Lord enough. We need to praise the Lord every day of our lives. We need to be in an attitude of praise. We need to have the joy of the Lord in our hearts. People need to see smiles on our face. And then when they ask, what are you smiling about? I'm a Christian. I'm praising the Lord. And then it says, because of salvation. Hey, I got news for you. God did not have to choose you. He did not. He chose you. He wooed you. He came to you. He saved you. And the reason you're not going to hell because he chose you and you accepted, you trusted in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation. Folks, the greatest gift we have in our lives is salvation. So we see we are praising because of salvation and because of glory. We've seen the glory of God. We've seen God act. We've seen miracles of God. We've seen answered prayers of God. And folks, I do not think in our mind we can fathom what heaven's going to be like. We're going to see the glory of God. And I pray that you will understand that all glory goes to God, and not only uh, salvation and glory, and honor, and honor. It is an honor to be saved, folks. God, uh, he, he, has, he, he, loves, he loves us to reverence him and to respect him. We need to honor our Lord and Savior with our very being. We need to give him first place in our lives. And power, and we know what power is. Folks, there is no power stronger than God Almighty. We have seen this in the book of Revelation. And that same power, that acts to power, that dunamis that talks there, all right? It is the power of God in the person of the Holy Spirit. With God's help, there is nothing I cannot do. I can do all things with Christ who strengthens me. And that power, what is amazing, is available to us. Man, when I look at some of y'all, I'm not sure it's there, folks. How you doing? Oh, I'm okay. How you doing? I'm just treading water. You got a life jacket. <laughs> Put it on. You are a victor. And so many Christians do not live in the power of Jesus Christ. Oh, folks, the Holy Spirit is our power. Belong to the Lord our God, for true and righteous are his judgment. True is yes and amen. God has never lied. God will never lie. His word is truth, and righteousness are his judgments. He's never made a mistake, even in all that is going on in Revelation. And it sounds harsh sometimes, 
But folks, God had given man and given man and given man chance after chance after chance. He sends 144,000 witnesses. He sends even angels declaring uh, the salvation. Even through the tribulation, he has given people a chance to get saved. So I am telling you, his judgments are righteous because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication and has avenged her with the blood of his servants shed by her. Oh, folks, God has the last say. In the blood of saints, the martyrs that have died during the tribulation, I tell you, God has noticed those things. And God takes vengeance on those who killed his children. And we need to know that. Matter of fact, Psalm 57. Hold your finger there and go to Psalm 57 with me. Psalm 57 speaks of Christian persecution. My soul is among lions. I lie among, verse 4, I lie among the sons of men who are set on fire. That happened during the Romans, it, 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 you know, the Roman time. They literally set Christians on fire, whose teeth are spears and arrows, and their tongue are sharp so, a sword. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be above the earth. They have prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They have dug a pit before me. In the midst of it, they themselves have fallen. God, in chapter 19, turns the tables. I am telling you, he is saying we have victory in Jesus. My heart is steadfast. Oh God, my heart is steadfast. I will sing and give praise. Awake my glory. Awake lute and harp. I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing to you among the nations. For your mercy reaches into the heavens and your truth unto the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be above the earth. Folks, we have seen God's glory. Every time someone gets saved, every time someone walks down these aisles and gives their heart and life to Jesus, we see the glory of God. We can have a little bit of heaven here on earth. And look at that last verse, verse 5 in uh, Revelation 19. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you servants of those who fear him, both great and small. Two things, folks, we need to fear God, not in the thing of being afraid of him. It's to honor him. It's to respect him. It's to show him reverence. And folks, great and small, that means God does not have favorites. Folks, God loves everyone everyone and sometimes we think people that have power or even we think people that have money and people whose name are up there flashing in the lights i'm telling you we think they are stronger as christians than others and folks when god looks upon mankind we are all the same in god's eyes and I tell you, the, the scripture tells us, uh, Psalm, Psalm 150, Psalm 150, talking about praise the Lord. Hallelujah is in verse 1. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty, work, mighty firmament. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet, which we have, the lute and the harp. The, uh, with the, praise him with the timbrel and the dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and flutes. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with clashing cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. And then one more, praise the Lord. Oh, my friend, we ought to praise God. For our salvation. Every day that you get up, you need to thank God for another day 
to live on this earth. We have purpose as Christians. Our God, I, our God in heaven, my Father has passed away, but I've got a heavenly Father that looks over me, that guides me, that gives me good advice. I can trust Him. I can trust His Word. And we need to praise God for His salvation. Well, not only do we need to praise Him for His salvation, we need to glorify God for His bride. For His bride. We've seen three hallelujahs in this, hallelujahs in this first few verses, and we're going to see another one. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Folks, I am telling you, when we look here, John hears a very loud voice, a very loud voice, a great, men, a great multitude. And I believe uh, when we look at this here and, and we see, and we, we talked earlier, and, and I did, I forgot, I skipped, <laughs> I skipped chapter, verse 4. I, let me go back to 4, I just realized I skipped that. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sat on the throne. The 24 elders, there's the 12, which represents the tribe of Israel, which is the Old Testament, okay? And then the 12, it's the 12 apostles. That represents the New Testament. So it's speaking here of all of mankind praising God. And you have to think, when it comes to a wedding, you have invitations there. And there's two groups not mentioned in this part of it. All right, you have the Old Testament saints. You're talking David and Moses and all those Elijah and them. And then you have saints during the tribulation period. And that's who goes in the part that I had just read. They are joining in on the praise. So you have you 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 just have it all covered, is what I'm trying to say in this part. That's why there was a great multitude. That's why it was the sound of many waters and the sound of mighty thunderings. I'll never forget, you know, when I, I've been in, uh, it happened in Oklahoma City, and uh, we were at the Ford Center there, and we were there for a conference, a men's conference, uh, you know, promise keepers there. And there were somewhere around 15,000 men there singing praises. And folks, I am telling you, Chills literally went up the back of my neck. I can remember that. And that has been a long, long time ago. Why? Because God's Holy Spirit, He connects with the praises of His people. And I just mentioned that to tell you, can you imagine what heaven's going to be like? Can you imagine the sound that is going to happen when we all get there? It is going to be tremendous. It's going to be amazing. Our mouths are going to drop. We're going to look around, and we're going to hear everyone singing perfect pitch. And folks, we need to understand that we have uh, you know, reasons to praise God, and we should praise Him for His salvation, but we should praise, you know, glorify Him for His bride. And His bride is the church. It is the church. And it says, uh, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Folks, he controls everything. Right now, it seems like he's not controlling anything to some people. I've even heard this said by Christians. Where is God right now? I'll tell you where he is. He's in the same place he's always been. He is in heaven. He knows what he is doing. Man is reaping what they have sowed. Folks, since the fall of Adam and Eve, we have been in a spiral of sin. And it has gotten worse and worse. Things now going on, it makes our head spin. We would never have thought when I was growing up, things that now are all over the news and, and reports and all these things of killing children and, and aborting babies and doing these things. 
And that's what he is doing. Folks, he is making things right here. He is preparing a place for us. It will be a perfect place. God controls everything. His timing is right. He is all-powerful. He will defeat. We haven't even got to the battle of Armageddon yet, but he will defeat Satan. And it says, verse 7, Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself, made herself ready. All through the book of Revelations, folks, you know what God says? Even Jesus in the Gospels. What is he saying? Matthew chapter 24, what is he saying? Be ready. Be ready. Be ready. Why hasn't he come yet? Because there are still people that need to be saved. Still people. And we are his hands, folks. We are his feet. We are his mouth. And he is using us to, to you know, bring in Okay, the rapture of the church when that last person is saved. God is going to look at, over at Jesus and say, go get your bride. And oh, what a day, folks, that will be. And it's like the marriage. It, it's, it's just like, you know, he's preparing a, a wedding feast. He is preparing a marriage we are going to go. Folks, the thousand-year millennium will be a place of perfection, all right? It will be a place here on earth. God has changed the earth. What was trash, what was full of sin, he has destroyed in chapters 17 and 18. And we go to that marriage of the bride of Christ between the lamb and the bride, and we need to be ready. Verse 8, and to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen and clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of God. And, you know, I, I don't know how many marriage ceremonies I've performed. There's, there's been a lot of them over the years. But I'm telling you, the thing that stands out in every marriage that I perform, it is the bride, okay? It is the bride, Man, she has that white dress on. I know some that it's been three and four hours getting ready. Now, again, however long it takes, that's fine, okay? Because here's what the bride wants. I mean, you want to look perfect, all right? And when I see them standing, and when right before they take the, the vows, they face each other and they hold hands. And you can just see all right, the groom in a tux and the bride, and, and that bride is so pretty. That bride is just stands out. But do you know in the marriage that we are talking about, guess who's going to stick out? It's Jesus. It's the bridegroom. All right, he's the, he's the one. He's the one. He has made all these things happen. Yes, the church is beautiful. Yes, the church is purified. That's why we have, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be judged. We'll be judged before we go to the thousand-year reign. Why? Because we as saints need to be pure and holy. We will be at the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema seat, and that's the one for Christians. And so he will get us ready for heaven. I don't know about you, but I can't wait. Matter of fact, Matthew chapter 16, we quote this in the Lord's Prayer all the time. But you have to understand, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The way we are, we're not ready for heaven. We haven't been perfected yet. Yes, we have been forgiven. Yes, the blood of Jesus covers our sins and cleanses us. But that's what that is for. That time is, is for getting the bride ready for, uh, for heaven. And then it says, fine linen and bright linen in the righteous acts of God. Look at Ephesians 5. Go with me to Ephesians 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus. And the emphasis here is on husbands and wives and weddings. 
okay, and, and in the marriage relationship. But it's also an illustration of Jesus Christ and his bride. Husband, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. I'm telling you in my marriage counseling, the first question I ask, do you love this person? The second question I ask, would you be willing to die for her? And if that man hesitates, he just made his first mistake. Because <laughs> that bride wants to hear, I'll be willing to die. That's what they want to hear. Folks, Jesus was willing to die. He loves the church. He established the church. All right? It is we, the church, is his bride, and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. That's why the word is so, so important, folks. You cannot grow in your walk with God without reading the Word of God. You need to pick it up every day. People say, well, I'm busy. I don't have time. Well, you need to change something in your life. You need to change it. You need to spend time in God's Word that he might present a her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or, or anything, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Man, I'm telling you, once we go, uh, you know, uh, to the Bema seat, folks, we will be pure and holy and ready for heaven. The Bible tells us in, uh, first, uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, flesh and blood does not enter the kingdom of God. God and Jesus is getting his bride ready. And look at verse 32. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ in the, in the church. Folks, Jesus Christ died for the church, and we as Christians are the bride of Christ. So we see, praise God for salvation glorify God for his bride. And number three, worship God for the witness of Jesus. I love this. And he said, right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, folks, blessed. We are a blessed people. We are a blessed church. And you have to understand that that that, that, that marriage ceremony and that marriage supper will be hosted by Jesus himself. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. And I fell at the feet and worshiped him. But he said to me, see that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant. Folks, I'm telling you, John, you know, he was told to write this. And John was getting a glimpse in heaven John saw all the singing and the praises that was going on, and John got caught up in all of that. And all at once, he, you know, he, he, just, he just, you know, just worshipped. He, he fell down at the feet of this angel, this angel which was making these announcements. And the angel tells him, do not do that. Folks, the only one we sh should worship is God in Jesus. We should worship no man. No man. And folks, we tend to worship men. We really do. Even in pastors. And it breaks my heart. I've seen it myself. That there'll be a pastor that has been somewhere for a long time. And that church has grown. And that church has grown. And that church has grown. And uh, you know, somewhere he either retires or he's called to another position. And the next pastor, they do not, you know, respect like they should. And I've seen it go down. And, and, and I, I've even heard people say, well, he's not, brother. Folks, we should not compare pastors to pastors. We should not follow pastors. I'll tell you honestly, if this church doesn't go on after I leave, then too many people have their eyes right here. Folks, I am just a tool of God. 
I have never saved anyone. It is God. It is God. And we need to bow down. We need to worship God for who He is. He's the one that brings salvation into our lives. His Word is what disciples us. It's all about God and Jesus. Quit following man. And by the way, you can get anybody you want online. Okay? Watch and be careful who you're watching. I know by some of the statements that people make, almost who they're watching, and I'm saying to myself, you better be careful because they need to be men of God that preach the pure gospel of God. So John, caught up in worship, was bound to this angel. This angel says, man, get up, get up. I'm a servant, I'm a servant like you. And of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And here it is, folks. Worship God. Worship God. That's what we come here on Sundays to do. And you can have worship anytime. You can worship in your truck. I worship in my truck all the time. I got Christian music going. If I'm in my truck, I got Christian music going. And I have, folks, there's been times I hear a new song, and there's been times that I literally had to pull over because there was tears in my eyes, and I was crying, and I was worshiping God through music. And it says, who have the testimony of Jesus. Folks, it's not about us. It's not about what we have done. It's not about what we've memorized or how many Bible courses we have taken or that we've taught or that we are a deacon or that we're a staff member. It's about Jesus and the testimony of Jesus. I got news for you. You're not topping him. His testimony is yes and amen. Don't follow man, follow Jesus. And you know what it'll produce? Worship worship for the testimony of jesus is the spirit of prophecy folks i'm telling you jesus can be seen everywhere every book of the bible old testament and new testament old testament prophecy about jesus who is to come isaiah it's there folks when we live our lives, when we talk about Christianity, we need to talk about Jesus. Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, verse 8. Then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. Folks, we need to be Spirit-filled Christians. Spirit-filled rulers of the people and elders, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here whole. See, he walked by and a guy was crippled and he said, silver and gold have I none, Peter said, but in the name of Jesus, you rise up and walk. And I'm telling you, talk about a testimony. These people had seen him at the gate year after year after year. In verse 11, And this stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone, nor is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men which we must be saved our uh, folks it's jesus man it's jesus he created us he was in creation he loves us he lived a perfect life he was born of a virgin he is waiting for us to come to him he has wooed people to salvation and i am telling you if Folks, if you're here today and don't know Jesus Christ, I am telling you, you need to be saved today. We don't know when the rapture is coming. It could happen today. And we need to be ready and we need to be busy telling people about Jesus. 
You know, there's a song that I've been listening to, and it's called We're Almost Home. And I'm telling you, I have listened to that. I couldn't even tell you how many times this week. Because I keep thinking and I keep thinking, we're almost home. We're not just on the back nine, folks. We're on 18 right now. God could come at any minute. So what is it to the Christian? Let me give you four things in closing. Four ways to be ready for the coming of Christ. The church prepares herself by remaining faithful to Christ in a falling world. We need to be faithful to Christ. Two, the church prepares herself by enduring hardships in the midst of suffering. It's going to be hard. Folks, it's going to get harder. We're going to find out what persecution really is sooner than you think. Number three, the church prepares herself by trusting God in the face of being put to death. See, all the talk is going to quit, okay? You can talk a good thing, but I'm telling you, when it comes to dying for the cause of Christ, it separates the real strong Christians from them. Folks, I'm telling you, when you're threatened, okay, with the mark of the beast and when all this is going on, Many people are going to turn towards man and not to Christ. Number four, the church prepares herself by obeying God and sharing the gospel with everyone. <laughs> Folks, we got something to do. We're not just here to hang out. We're here to lead people to Christ, to show people the glory of God, to show people how that they can be saved. And we need to be ready. Father, thank you for this day. And God, I just thank you for your word. And God, I just can't wait. I cannot wait uh, to see you. I, I cannot wait for the rapture of the church. And God, heaven is a perfect place. No more sin, no more temptation, no more crying, no more pain. And God, I thank you that you sent your son to die for us. God, I pray if there's one here that doesn't know you today, God, I pray today would be their day of salvation. God, if there's a Christian here that needs to rededicate their life, I pray that they would come to one of us or even come to this altar and pray. And God, I pray if there's folks that need to be baptized, they have not been scripturally baptized, that you would speak to them this day. And God, I also pray for church membership, God, they've been They've come here, they know who we are, we, they know what we're about. And God, if the Holy Spirit tells them, I pray that they would join our church this day. God, this is your church. And God, we just want to be the church, the church who you made us to be. God, I know we're not perfect, but we don't have to be. We're forgiven. So God, I pray as we have this time of invitation that you would speak to us. God, I pray it would be so clear that we would obey the voice of God. And God, we'll give you the glory and the honor and the praise. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?